All right, so today's topic is Migrant Remittances Transforming Communities. Um, I really should have put a question mark at the end because it certainly is a debate. Anything to do with migration is a debate. And when I say communities, while the emphasis is on the communities of origin, the um, questions also come up about what's happening in the communities where the migrants are living and um, what's happening between communities uh, as well. Global migration at this point of time is very large. There are more than 200 million migrants counted uh, as current migrants worldwide and that is a stock concept. If we add China in, we would double that. <clears throat> Total, they're counting for about 3% of the world's population. If we assume there's an undercount, even if we doubled it, it'd be about 6% of the world's population. And about half these migrants are women, although many people never question if that has any implications for the particular studies that they're doing. I would assume, from my background, that there's almost always some implications of that if people would take the time to look for them. So, there are a lot of remittances too, and this is the part that has caught the attention of development specialists and policymakers, officials in countries all around the world in the last few years. Uh, this gives you, from the most up to date figures I've seen, just released this month uh, as estimates, but good estimates from Dilip Ratha at the World Bank who seems to be the leading expert on remittances these days um, in those kind of circles. And it shows the top developing country recipients of migrant remittances. And you can see that the big recipients are India, China, uh, India, China and Mexico, followed by still a, a pretty good group of countries that are receiving. If you look in terms of percentage of GDP that's received, though, you see completely different countries. A lot of the smaller countries are very, very dependent on remittances these days for all of their government spending. And Ch Tajikistan is the highest, Moldova, Tonaga, Tonga, and Lesotho. <coughs> so the top source countries, the United States definitely dominating not just to Mexico and Latin America, but also to India and China, followed by Saudi Arabia, Switzerland, Germany, and Spain. <coughs> can you see, if you can see this numbers across the top row, that's the most significant line here. That, uh, and again, this is from February this, uh, this year. So that the remittance flows, even since the early 2000s, have grown tremendously for countries around the world. They've gone um, from US 116 billion going to developing countries in 2002 to in 2007, and I can I have a little dot here, 2007 you have 281 billion and Ratha and his group are estimating that even in 2008, even despite the downturn, there's still going to be about $305 billion of remittances to developing countries for the year. And that, uh, as I'll talk about later, even though we're in this global recession and things are tightening up, they don't expect this to fall to pieces. So this is something that has got to catch the attention of people when you see this kind of flow from typically more developed countries to developing ones and also some between different developing countries. You notice in this row that the growth rate has been quite high every year for remittances in the 2000s. Again, significant private source, of course, in an age of neoliberal policies which are stressing market relations and interactions, uh, a private flow of this magnitude has caught a lot of attention. Now, one question we can ask is with the switch in the policies implemented in the United States, during this recession and in the EU, will, be there, will there be a rethinking of whether or not they have to rely so much on the market and international flows when places like the World Bank and the IMF and others make their recommendations for how you adjust to crises? And in fact, there's already been some shift. 
to give more government involvement. So in this paper, as in a lot of my work, I'm taking a human security approach. So I'm considering economic development or socioeconomic development because I believe that an interdisciplinary approach is particularly useful in the context of understanding development issues in general, but also um, what we would call human security more specifically. And that I'm taking a Marcia Sen and Martha Nussbaum's kind of view of development, looking at an expansion of capabilities. That is an expansion of the real opportunities people have to achieve valued doings and beings in society. There's no easy way to define this concept that sounds totally natural because it's not the everyday use of capability. It is the idea of this real opportunity. Um, and it involves the idea of agency as well as well-being. The human security area is actually, uh, was begun to be used by the UNDP and the Human Development Reports and other groups in the mid-90s. And it emphasizes a little section of development that focuses more on basic needs like housing and adequate nutrition and education, these kind of aspects. But um, it also includes a broader view than just basic needs. It includes this idea of sustainability, both in terms of the types of policies and in environmental sustainability. And it includes the idea of agency, of people being able to act, to participate fully in society, to be able to share in decision making and things like that, and not just to be passive recipients of whatever policies we give to them. Um, and so in this respect, human security implies an increase and in a care about things like gender equity. Okay. So here are some kind of blurry pictures that you can find online from UN Instraw. This is an institute <coughs> that has been one of the few paying any attention to, well, what's going on with women's remittances. And this is a study on the Philippines that they're doing. Um, and they've just had also some online virtual discussions of remittances um, and gender and remittance issues and migration issues more broadly that you can also find online if you do a little Googling around for these things. The first picture up here is a child with his nanny while his mom is a migrant out of the country. This is a wall of pictures and the idea here is you have your, the children who have graduated and their diplomas. And then this is a migrant house that's being built in the Philippines. So these are typical uses of remittances that people receive, especially people in developing countries receive. Uh, so we might ask, okay, so one use is education. And that's certainly, I would say, in and of itself, enough to give uh, some encouragement that play, perhaps remittances can be very important in transforming communities because um, we're here because we believe education plays this important role in society. And it also, there's a study that is just published or being published that you can get online right now in the journal World Development, focusing on El Salvador. And in their latest study, they were looking at some of the impacts of remittances in that country. And the main one that they were focusing on, or that st stood out in the work, was that the remittances increased the amount that young children went to school and it especially had an impact on girls getting to go to school. It also had a milder impact on a related issue which was reducing child labor. So these are all very positive kind of goals and I, I recommend that you take a look at that if you want to see more. So that's, that's first and very important and one of the typical responses uh, that people give when you ask what they're sending back the remittances for. To educate their siblings uh, is mo very, very common. 
it's not so easy to measure these things on a global scale, but we can take these general trends and the amount we know and then look at specific cases to understand better how things play out in different contexts. So another thing is on better nutrition for the family, uh, clearly. And a big one is the housing and land. Many, many people from Mexico will say that they're building a house so that they can go back later and they'll have it, as well as building houses for other relatives. One of the reasons some people like Doug Massey suggest that we have so much migration from Mexico into the United States is because there's a failure of those kind of credit markets, like mortgage markets, that let people buy housing on credit instead of having to have huge amounts of income that they can go out and use to purchase a house. So by coming to the United States, they can overcome those market failures. Healthcare is another area that is a common use of remittances. And sometimes they're used to do things like pay off debts and perhaps even travel and perhaps do other things that don't seem to be so much basic needs. Um, in fact, there's some criticism of that uh, at times. But overall, I think if you trace out what people are doing with these many billions of dollars of remittances going back, these categories would cover huge amounts of that. So if you notice them, we're not talking about doing business. We're not talking about opening a new store or something along those lines. Now traditional, more mainstream development economists would like to see that kind of business behavior because then the remittances generate other kinds of income hopefully generating enough to be able to do these things and keep growing and do more. But the real world hasn't worked out like that for a lot of places. <coughs> Make you come up, Jim. And <laughs> so this is what, uh, what is going on. And it's not like borrowing money for consumption-ish items because you don't have to repay the remittances usually. I mean, they're gifts, they're intra-family gifts most of the time. So, yes, you use it on consumption, not investment. You would need in order to maintain that standard of living or those kind of items in your life, you very likely would need to have a continuing stream of remittances, um, um, except for things like housing. Well. If you think about it, housing you might pay off, you may, not, you may not need it forever. Education, the kids may grow up and uh, graduate or start paying for their own. But in general, there's a tendency to need a reliance on continued stream of remittance. And especially if you look at the country as a whole and you're talking about ongoing items like this. But I would strongly argue and there are a few other voices that are pretty loud in this respect these days, but not always published. It, it, oh no, go wake up. <laughs> wake up. Oh, there, good. That having, um, spending on these type of items of consumption that are human security areas of people's lives that often uh, address the needs of the poor in society, the poorest elements of society, and that may actually either improve people's well-being within this designation of being poor, or even lift them out of poverty potentially, that these areas of consumption spending are well worth that kind of, of decision on the part of the people receiving remittances, and that it's actually a very good thing to have this kind of spending going on. It improves children's lives, it improves the adults' lives. Now this doesn't mean remittances are without problems, but for many people, there's some significant gains. And it's worth thinking about those and caring about those. And I think that the trade-off between consumption and investment is especially questionable for those who are considered below the poverty line in whatever country you're looking at. Another area of remittances that has begun to get more attention is portrayed in this documentary called The Sixth Section, 
that some of you may have seen by Alex Rivera. He was here on campus and it's also been played on PBS. Uh, and I think you may, the, I know the Latino Studies Center, Latino Latino Studies Center had a copy and they may still uh, have it available for borrowing if you're interested. Uh, and this documents these hometown clubs that are especially prevalent in some parts of the US. Uh, and as you can see here, a lot of them, oops, wrong button. A lot of them are mainly men. Uh, the one in his documentary is a group of, main, of men, basically, that he's following, uh, who are low-income earners, but who are sending back a lot of money to Mexico. And um, they are making community remittances, not just family remittances. And these community remittances, usually the way it, often the way it works is that the hometown club people uh, decide what they want to use it for, and proceed to collect the money together and do that. So in this particular documentary, he talked about three things that they decided to do with their money. These people who were working as day laborers uh, that you wouldn't think would have any money to send back. And the first one, if you can see the picture there, a baseball player, they decided they needed a stadium, a baseball stadium. And they built it, and they got a lot of attention for that. The governor of the state actually met with them and, you know, praised them and their efforts. Um, as a person not as closely tied into baseball, I was not quite as convinced why they had built the baseball stadium as their first project. But one thing that may have been going on that some people have talked about to me um, is that, you know, maybe they thought this was an opportunity for youth to get ahead, you know, get a few of them might get through and get baseball contracts and it's an exciting event. Another thing is just that it's a social connection and we, the, the point of social connections go beyond economic value. Now whether or not women are also included in this social connection I'm not as clear on, whether or not they, they certainly are not the baseball players that the stadium was designed for whether or not they attend the games and so and are involved in that way, it's, it wasn't clear from the documentary. <clears throat> After that, another thing they built was, uh, they didn't build, they decided, you see the back end of this ambulance, that they found a source for a used ambulance. And they thought, well, you know, our, our little area doesn't have an ambulance. Whereas here in the US, there are ambulances all over the place and they save lives, they get people to hospitals quickly. Uh, maybe we could raise funds and buy this used ambulance and help people get to the hospital and save lives. And so they did that. Uh, that one was not so successful because ambulances are hard to maintain. And they were in an area that was pretty remote in terms of roads and wasn't very kind to ambulances. And so this expenditure actually fell apart on them because they couldn't maintain it. And perhaps I feel if they had had, you know, I think grassroots ideas are wonderful, but I think we ought to also be realistic. There should be some point to education and sharing our education, either as NGOs, and people working in NGOs, people working in government agencies, or as researchers associated with campuses or volunteers. And maybe if there had been a little interaction or resource for them to talk about, they could have evaluated different ways to transport people to hospitals in that kind of situation and the cost involved with trying to maintain an ambulance. Um, and maybe they would have been able to use their money more effectively after earning it with a lot of hard work. A third thing that they did before this very short documentary ended, uh, that was more successful after the ambulance, they decided to go for something they could really handle. And they built, um, they built a little area in a local school so that the kids could eat, like the little nursery school kids and kindergartners could have food available there and get more nutritious food easily and help them study, those kind of things. And that, that turned out to be a very successful project for them. So for community remittances like this, here are some typical type of expenditures you see around the world. You see health clinics, 
You see expenditures on infrastructure like roads and lighting and um, bridges, perhaps. Often you see renovation of churches, which again would not be your first development component, but is very important in a lot of communities. Building sports facilities and setting up credit clubs because there's often an inadequate supply of credit for running businesses. And if everybody questioned the importance of credit in people's livelihoods, recent activities should have made that clear that those are important functions for most market activities. And indeed, economic restructuring programs, structural adjustment programs, transition policies have all been stressing market activities for 20 years or so. So these are things that are needed uh, in many aspects. Some examples of a program where the government has been encouraging these things more and has played a role in trying to make it more feasible to build up community uh, remittances quickly, but without with using incentives rather than some kind of compelling force like taxes, is the Mexico's three for one program where local, state, and federal level agencies, governments, um, match the community remittances that come in. And this is a program that has definitely been generating some interest internationally and some people trying out variations. One critique that I have is that so far, these hometown clubs haven't necessarily caught on so that they're really broad-based. They seem to be mostly a male thing. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have them. I certainly think that there's a potential of them doing some excellent work and addressing one of the issues of private remittances, which is that they only go to certain people in the community, whereas the hometown clubs are trying to spread this out by giving community remittances that can help more people. So you have a, a playoff here in terms of equality of distribution. Remittances in general, we should re all think of as a major step in redistributing income from rich countries to poor countries globally. But within the country, they can cause a lot of inequality because some people get them and some people don't. Something like community remittances are quite attractive in addressing some of that issue within countries. This table is from a study then looking at the other end of the community. This is a local pilot study that we did here in Illinois in the last couple of years where we looked at some women and men and we were looking at a variety of human security issues for people in this area and remittances was one element of it. You know, in hindsight, I wish we had asked a whole lot more questions on remittances, but at least it gave us some idea of what was going on with Latino in immigrants here, mostly uh, ones from Mexico, but some from other areas in Latin America. And we had 28 men, 28 women, and essentially all of them were employed. That, and this was not a random sample, so we did find people who were working, but it was easy to find people who were working because so many of them are engaged in different kinds of activities. In terms of remittances, you can see that most people were sending back remittances. And most of these people were employed pretty much at minimum wage or just a little bit above it. And yet they were sending back somewhere between 50 and $250 a month. And a bunch of them, all of these, were sending back more than $250 a month on average. So they're making a sacrifice. They're uh, trying to, they're, if their family is with them, and some of them do have, or their whole, fam whole families together, or at least their whole nuclear family of the husband, wife, and children. Um, but a lot of them are different parts of different families. They have that more extended family that they still care about, and many of those are back in their country of origin. And they're deciding not to spend money on getting better housing or better education or better clothing or whatever here in order to send it back and on those kind of things that we talked about 
a few minutes ago, or that I talked about a few minutes ago. And on average, you can see that while they all were send, most of them were sending back, the total remittances were much lower for the women than men. That's not that surprising because even though they all were working somewhere near minimum wage, women's wages on average were indeed lower than men's. And so even if they were sending the same or slightly different amount of remittances, they, had, um, they were less likely to get that same total. And in fact, their average was a little bit lower too. But still, everybody, I mean, it is impressive the social and cultural connections that get people to remit and to keep supporting for a long term those other family members, as well as those who consider even more remittances to go back to the community. Uh, and people who, here, though, were saying when we asked about whether or not they belonged to hometown associations, they didn't. Nobody said they belonged to any hometown association, so they hadn't really gotten that going in this downstate area. There are definitely some up in Chicago area, but this is considered a non-traditional area for migrants. And these, though, were some of their views. If you, in order to, a lot of times, one of the criticisms is that we don't pay enough attention to looking at the migrant and considering the migrant a person and rather than an instrument of development. And so I think that using qualitative methods along with quantitative is very useful in getting those sides of things. And here are some of the very typical things that people said. It, they, weren't being, they didn't see this social commitment as a compulsion. They did it because um, they cared that their family members didn't have a job and that they needed support or that a house needed to be built and um, because they needed the things like food and school and clothing or because they just wanted to thank their parents for all they had done and they felt good, made them feel good to send some of, some of that money back. Um, so obviously, if the migrant intends to return home, they're more likely to want to do things home of origin. They're more likely to do things like want to build housing that they may live in long term. Some studies, like um, in a book by Pirette Hongdono Sotelo not too long ago, illustrate that maybe women are more likely to want to stay here once they get here than to return, especially if they have children who grow up here because they want to be closer to their children. Whereas men are more likely to have that long-term sense of taking the family back to the place of origin. Um, that would be interesting to see if it changes over time, but that's what she found in her study a few years ago. So it leads, me, one of the questions that it puts in my mind that some of you might be doing research on or um, may consider doing research on is how they make those decisions within a family unit about whether they're going to spend the money in Mexico or in Guatemala or Peru or if they're going to spend it here in Illinois or you can transfer that to other countries around the world. So I want to come back now to this issue of the question of transforming communities. And it's not so easy to transform communities. And I think that people have overplaced emphasis in development circles on the role that re private remittances can play. They can do a lot of things that I think are really great, but they're not going to solve everything, and they're not going to relieve the government in a social contract from delivering certain kinds of goods and services to people that can make their lives much more secure, much more decent and meet basic needs and other things that make life enjoyable, worth living, flourishing. So here I ask, is there a rethinking of the ne neoliberal development model? I think we're wide open for new studies because I do think the answer is yes. There, there are enough of us that are rethinking that, have been criticizing it for a long time, but now we actually will have more evidence because of the different package of policies that are going to be playing out uh, in examining some of this. And there were some policies around the world already, but there'll be many more, I believe. So do remittances promote development and human security? Uh, some of this, then, to summarize some of the ideas and pull them together, 
at the end of this is that they are a source of foreign exchange earnings. That's been important for countries like the Philippines and Mexico and a bunch of other countries um, around the world for quite a, quite a few years. Their insurance for downturns, which is definitely a human security kind of concept, and we're in a big downturn right now, and there's a huge question about what role our remittance is going to play. Are they going to be able to keep up at the level that they have? As I mentioned at the beginning, De La Prada and the World Bank thinks that there are several case scenarios we don't know in this current downturn what we're going to end up with in a few months. Will we be able to level it out and really pull out of this or not? Will there be a lot of lag where other countries continue to feel the impact before we get out of it? But in a best case scenario, you're not going to see a total collapse, a collapse of remittances and people who are sending them on the good side will not have had their income earnings collapse uh, by implication. So you have a slight downturn, you'll have a downturn to some magnitude, but overall don't expect remittances to fall too much. Some remittances have fallen. Mexico is the leading case of where they have turned down already. But they haven't just collapsed. There's been something like 3% or so downturn so far. And the whole stock of migrants sends remittances, not just the annual flow. So that's one thing that tends to keep remittances more level and somewhat counter-cyclical because people are sending them to family members. And in the past, when you look at a crisis, they have gone up in the crisis and right after the crisis in a lot of different countries. But another thing about this particular crisis right now that's different is that it's starting in the US and the EU, the countries where people came to work and send back to their homes where there are other crises. And we just don't know how much that's going to change the effect of what's going on. So they can't be relied on to soak up the impact of that crisis completely. So who can? You have to look at governments and negotiations with governments. And to some degree, civil society like NGOs can play roles and even businesses. But I think you have this social contract that, again, you come back to if you're going to achieve an increase, a broad-based increase in human security through remittances and associated policies. This is the increased spending and education is a long-term benefit that can really play an important role. Housing, also important. Housing is important. Sometimes people who don't live around uh, developing country and poverty issues don't realize what an important role housing plays, not only in terms of shelter, but in terms of doing business. And perhaps there's a lot of business going on that isn't caught up and measured in the statistics on remittances that we have so far. There are many, quite a few studies have shown a reduction in poverty, at least to some extent, that's associated with remittances. One of the critiques of migration in general these days is that we're having a brain drain, especially of some of the highly educated workers in computers and electronics and some of the healthcare workers. And remittances actually are greater from in return to the countries that these people come from. So that might offset some of the brain drain. It doesn't resolve all the issues. But when we're thinking about impacts of remittances, that's one of the things we should think about, that uh, the higher paid professionals that are coming in are able to send back more remittances is basically what it comes down to, and they do. Uh, remittances themselves can increase inequality. Somebody gets a house, but the next door neighbor doesn't. The whole neighborhood, if half the people are getting houses bought by migrants that are family members and the other half aren't, may see the value, the value of those houses go up as the neighborhoods improve, but that means for the people who don't have housing that it costs more. So there's those kind of issues at play. But you certainly can't blame that just on the remittance and migrants. That happens with anybody who makes more money and you have issues of inequality from market policies of all kinds. Markets don't solve inequality. You need other kinds of government policies to achieve social goals like that. So I don't think it's completely fair to blame 
the remittance issue on that. It's a broader question. And there are different ways of resolving some of those issues. And in addition, there are also positive spillovers, like having educated kids, having better nourished kids and more health care. That helps the whole community. So let's try to be balanced when we look at the critique and the contributions. One area that I think is addressed some but needs more attention are the impacts on transnational families. A lot to me, and from what I study, there's a lot of hurtful policies that go on in separating families. It's clear that some governments have an interest in keeping up those foreign exchange flows. They want families to be separated so that there'll be an incentive to send back to the country of origin and not just have the new family relocated. There's some people who say that we should be broad-minded and assume, though, that, some, that others may not feel the same compulsion to stay with their kids and ha they don't mind having somebody else uh, taking care of them in the family or whatever, and we should also acknowledge those issues. It's a piece of the transnational family puzzle. And while, while there's no real, <coughs> real easy, clear-cut answer, I think that we need a whole lot more work on whether policies are contributing to high human cost in the creating and existing and promotion of transnational families. Another criticism of remittances is that in some areas, and I think this is relatively minor, that there's a drop in labor supply and effort because they're getting money from other countries. Now we don't see Bill Gates dropping his labor supply when he makes $100 a month from some other place. He seems to make more money, more work, do more. And in fact, in a lot of areas, people use these for productive means. Whether you consider, we may want to redefine consumption to be productive if it improves people's lives. So um, I think that it's, you can find some examples, but this is not the main thing that's happening. And there is definitely some ambiguity out there. There's definitely a lot of controversy out there. But overall, there's some real, um, there, there are lots of things that make us think, and make me think in particular in my work, that we ought to look more at remittances and not just throw them away, but that we shouldn't say, let's solve everything with a private flow. And this thing about all these women migrants, almost half of all, over half of all migrants, um, excuse me, just slightly under half of all migrants, and over half in some countries is pretty amazing, and yet we don't look too much at what's going on with that. So we need to pay more attention to who's sending the remittances and who's getting them, how they're using them. Does it make a difference if it's women or men? Does it make a difference if it's care work or not? Like a lot of women these days are involved in child care and health care, elder care when they migrate and send back remittances, and they seem to be responsible for the child care cost of the children who may be left at home. There's one gender issue that jumps out that people don't talk about in regular literature too much. They talk about it in the gender literature, uh, but not so much in others. We would like to know if both men and women remit sort of equally for housing and education, or do women step up more when there's a crisis? Um, What's going on with these micro en enterprises or other kinds of businesses that might start up? One thing that uh, jumped out of the gender and development literature 15 years ago was that women were doing a lot of work for earning income based in the home that researchers knew nothing about and did not report on and thought they weren't doing anything for earning income. So uh, there may, I think there may be a lot more going on than is usually documented. <clears throat> in terms of policies for remittances, here's just a few things that I would stress. I think we should have a facilitation of them because a lot of times now there's kind of a blockage from the high cost. In many places, I just read today, the average cost to send remittances, 20% of that hard earned money going to send remittances. Now there's been a shift because of the technology and it's beginning to get a lot cheaper. But as it gets cheaper, some places are beginning to think, hey, maybe we can tax these. Now, I don't think too many 
migrants are going to want to pay taxes on their remittance. Even if you argue that, oh, these taxes will go to improve the neighborhood or the village or something of that nature. Because how many of us really believe that that's where they're going to go? There are a lot of costs to collecting them, to distributing them. Maybe a little corruption. A lot of different things going on. So I think we should be very careful about policies that suggest taxing them. I was really surprised not long ago when I read an article by Lourdes Benaria, who's been writing on gender and development and economic restructuring cost and things like this for many years in an article in Feminist Economics this summer that some of you in the class have read. She actually recommends in there, toward the end, that maybe we should tax them, tax the remittances, and we can do even more socially with them. What happens when you tax a flow and people don't think it's going to be used for what you say and they don't think it's fair? that remittance pool is going to shrink. And maybe they'll still send the same remittances, but you're not going to see them because they're not going to use ways that they can get taxed. So I think taxing is a slippery slope, and I don't recommend it. But I think that it makes a lot of sense to find ways to facilitate it, to expand those technologies and lower the costs so that they can get to people. But that means you're still going to have to deal with those other people who don't get remittances in your town, in your community, in your state. <coughs> That's where also code, oops, excuse me, co-development comes in here, which has begun to be talked about more these days. In straw discussion, for instance, people were real keen on using this term. And co-development means that you look at the place of origin and the place where the migrants are living and look at policies in both places, how they affect the welfare of the whole range of people that are involved. And including the migrant, again, not just as an instrument for earning more dollars for development, but as a person who needs a whole bunch of policies to have better agency and well-being. We need to consider families and individuals within the families. So in terms of who sends, who receives, how are funds used, are these families separated? And we need to have government and NGOs so that we're not just stressing remittances. So thank you. <laughs>